So, uh, Joe, with this case, it's a little different from other cases where we have a lot of information leading up to the disappearance. We don't have a ton of information about what he did right before he disappeared, but we have we have a ton of great information on the search and rescue operation after, happened after he went missing, which was reported by the National Park Service, which I'm a little, little shocked because we've done a lot of these cases, and I, I don't really see too many cases where they detail out the search as well as they did here. So that may just be a, like we've mentioned in a lot of previous cases, each national park is kind of like its own little country and they do things differently. They report things differently. So maybe Mount Rainier just does a really great job of providing transparency in these cases. Uh, But either way, it's really interesting to see the details of what they did for this search. So start things off. He, uh, Sam set off on a solo hike on October 9th, 2020. Like we said, he was uh, planning to hike the area of the Mother Mountain Loop out of uh, Mowich Lake. This was actually where other hikers in the park last saw him on the 9th. So we have confirmation from other hikers that he was actually in the park, which is important because there are a lot of other cases where it's kind of just, we think he was in the park. Sure. And you you never have a confirmation from somebody that they saw him in the park or entering the park, but we know Sam was in the park on the 9th. Well, I think our job is to be skeptical and kind of question any potential narrative. So it's the idea of, did they, I know we had one episode. Was it, was it Rainier also, where we even speculated maybe they didn't even go on the trip? No, I don't think it was Rainier, but we've had several cases where we, we don't have that confirmation. So we're not 100% sure they were in the park. It's always a possibility. So we know... He was at the trailhead. Uh, well, they saw him near Lake Mowich, so they know he was he was deep in the park okay. um, on the 9th, and it was going to be a short hike. He planned to come out of the park on the 10th. So, um, oh, yeah, so he was going to hike in just a little bit, camp overnight, and come back out? Yeah, that was the plan. I, I think he, he may have was planning to just do the whole loop. I think you can do it in a day. And this is another thing that shows me that he was an experienced hiker, too, because he, he told people's itinerary. He said, I'm going in the ninth. This is what I'm doing. I'm coming out the 10th. Yeah. Um, yep, very smart. Yeah. Less experienced people sometimes will go hiking uh, and they won't tell anybody where they're going, what they're doing, when they plan to be out. And that, that makes it really hard for searchers to pick an area to search. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely. So um, he was expected to come back out of the park on the 10th by the 12th when his family hadn't heard from him, they reported him missing. And this, this part really is tough because um, we always say the first, the first day of a missing person's case, especially in uh, elevation is really important. And the fact that, you know, he was, he probably went missing sometime, you know, late on the ninth or on the 10th. So there's, you know, two whole days that no one was out there searching for him, no one was looking, and those those two days are critical to finding a person alive. Uh, so that really kind of sets the search back from the start. But you know, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, we've all been on hikes where we we say we're coming out at a certain time, and it, we always come out later. So that happens. <laughs> uh, so that's not uncommon. But so. The afternoon of the 12th, the National Park Service quick response team uh, began searching and continued searching through the night with the help of the U.S. Air Force helicopter from the 36th Rescue Squadron out of uh, Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane. And they were utilizing uh, FLIR, which we we talk about a lot. That's pretty commonly used these days. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before I go into more of the the actual search timeline, we've got some details about the the search area. So the primary search area, and this, this information all primarily comes from the National Park Service. So the primary search area was defined by a 17-mile Mother Mountain Loop Trail, with the teams branching off to explore spur trails leading higher on Mount Rainier and river drainages leading off of it. So, um, all right, so they, they did his itinerary, plus if he did any sightseeing offshoot yeah or anything like that and they're okay. even you know even checking river drainages because there were a lot of rivers that he would have crossed and you know he could have been swept away so that makes sense to check those drainage areas 
So the, the area where they were searching the terrain includes rugged remote wilderness with dense forests at elevations from 2,000 to 5,000 feet with a lot of exposed subalpine meadows uh, blanketed with fresh autumn snowfall. So it there's already snow on the ground, uh, but, you know, the elevation was not too high. You know, 5,000 feet, you're still in the tree line. I believe the tree line here is between 6,500 and 7,000 feet. So um, to note, there were several recent winter storms that had blanketed uh, much of the area in snow, and temperatures had been hovering between the 20s and 30s. And uh, freezing temperatures were going as low as 1,500 feet in elevation. So it's safe to assume that he was probably in sub-freezing temperatures his entire hike. Mm -hmm. And a storm on October 10th, the day after Duval began his hike, washed out the rustic river crossing uh, he would have used across the Carbon River. So, you know, when we get into our theories, I think that maybe is that one possible theory he tried crossing the river when he shouldn't have. We'll get into that. Um, according to MPS, rangers uh, were coordinating the search with the Washington State Emergency Operations Center and other state and local resources who are providing highly skilled rescuers trained to search in hazardous conditions and poor weather. So they had a really good team out there looking for them. And you'll see from this timeline, they spared no expense. And, I mean, they went at this thing full full bore and I don't know if it has to do with because he you know he was an up and coming you know academic in the university system out there and he had a really promising career that you know maybe played a part in the search but the searchers would never say they they pick favorites in their search so well I think there's I don't think they would ever pick favorites but I think when you have if you know the person you're looking for has experience and you look at them as a peer yeah, I feel like you you would adjust your search a certain way. So they like they, he's the type of person that had an itinerary, knew the area. So it's less of a they could be anywhere. More of all right, we're very confident he's going to be in these regions because of the type of person he is. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think the searchers probably knowing his history of you know hiking, they probably were pretty confident in those early days that they were going to find him. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, You'll see a theme throughout the search and rescue operation is poor weather. So we're now, it's now October 13th, and poor weather kept air crews grounded, but uh, 19 park rangers and 16 mountain, or six mountain rescue volunteers continued uh, the search on foot. They did find a distinctive water bottle believed to belong to Sam. It was found along one of the trails in the afternoon but it didn't lead to any further discoveries. So from what I researched, that water bottle really was the only thing they found of Sam within the park. So uh, they go on to say that in addition, a team from the Seattle Mountain Rescue used an aerial drone to explore hard reach sections of the old trail along the Carbon River. So this is a really cool advancement in search and rescue in the last couple of years is the use of drones. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, Going forward, I think this is really going to aid in the help of finding people alive and at least at a minimum recovering, you know, remains so families can get closure. Uh, we we really haven't seen the use of drones in our cases up until just very recently, I believe, Joe. Yeah, that is new. Remember when we worked together at, at Spalding, we talked about wanting to start a company with drones yeah. for this express purpose. We probably should have done that. <laughs> probably. Another missed opportunity. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so moving on to the next day, it is now October 14th, 2020. The weather had cleared up by that afternoon, and they were able to get a helicopter in the air uh, with 12 NPS Rangers 15 mountain rescue volunteers and now they have three search dogs provided by the washington mountain rescue on the ground so they they didn't, weren't able to get you know the dogs out there until several days after he went missing which uh that's that's unfortunate you know every day that goes by you know scent is gonna dissipate and especially if you've got a lot of snow and weather in the area it's gonna make it harder for those dogs to find a scent but sure and you have the whole issue of i wonder how much comes into play of uh evidence or things being moved by the snow melt 
when we talked yeah. to George Land, I know he said that it happens in flash flooding in the desert, but I wonder if that's the case too, if you have a lot of rushing water going down a mountain, if maybe he was on a trail and I don't want to speak grim, but I'm saying maybe his body was on a trail and it, if snow melt or something pushed it or covered it somewhere that was, mm -hmm. that would be not a well-searched area and it's covered in snow now. I don't know. Yeah. I think that's a, a high, you know, highly possible when with this much weather in the area. So <clears throat> moving on to the next day now, it's October 15th. The MPS reports a Bell 407 helicopter was used to fly searchers into the field to maximize search time during uh, a window of good weather and then continue to explore from the air. So they're, they're like frantically rushing to search the area because the weather has been so bad that they're actually, which we don't, see this a lot they're actually flying searchers in by helicopter to certain parts of the area um kind of like airlifting them in so that that's that's pretty amazing to see uh they go on to uh, state that 18 nps rangers were joined by 14 mountain rescue volunteers including a dog team two drone teams and a four by four team searching private forest lands outside of the park boundary a 10 person team of Pierce County Explorers search and rescue volunteers assisted well. So the team is growing. The assets they have available to them are growing. They have helicopters, dogs, drones, four by fours. And now they're even searching private land outside of the park. You know, maybe he got lost and started wandering. Um, I don't think that's too likely with the weather conditions at the time, but you know, mm -hmm. it's good to see them searching farther out. So, uh, October 16th now, the MPS stated, and this is a direct quote from them, today's weather has deteriorated with lowering clouds and winds up to 50 miles per hour that prevented air operations. Teams also experienced low visibility and driving rain. So, again, weather is hampering the search, but they were able to get 10 NPS rangers out there along with nine more mountain rescue volunteers and two teams from the Washington German Shepherd Search Dogs. So they keep adding to the team and to the kind of the, the ground force out there. Uh, they go on to say that members of the Washington State Search and Rescue Planning Unit have provided assistance throughout the week as well. MPS trail crews, meanwhile, worked throughout the day to restore a trail bridge over the Lower Carbon River, which washed out in heavy rain uh, early in the week in order to allow searchers easier access to the search zones. And NPS official uh, went on to say, and this is a direct quote, Searchers intend to take full advantage uh, tomorrow of a final day of good weather before another storm <laughs> forecast for Sunday with large numbers of people on the ground and hopefully in the air as well. So, you know, we are what? It's October 16th. He was reported missing on the 12th. You know, we're a full week out now from the date he was missing, and it's a massive operation going on. They've got a lot of people on the ground, you know, a lot of the assets in the air, uh, including drones, and the weather throughout this whole case has been hampering the search. I just wonder if the weather had been better, if they would have found him or found his remains. <laughs> um, but you will never know. So uh, moving on to October 23rd now of 2020, the uh, search was suspended after an 11 day operation inside Mount Rainier. Uh, the National Park Service uh, released a statement said significant weather, a winter weather made it necessary to suspend ground searches for the time being, but it would continue to pursue any leads that come. And they actually, while it was suspended, they were able to um, reinitiate the search on October 25th. And we have another MPS statement that reads, with an improved weather window, search teams in Mount Rainier National Park resumed ground baits ground-based search operations early Sunday for missing hiker uh, Dr. Sam Duvall. So October 25th, Joe, they're still, they're still out there searching. Obviously, at this time, I imagine the search turned from finding him alive to a recovery Yeah, I would operation. agree, because based on the gear he brought out, I mean, I would say there's a possibility he could still be alive just due to the fact that he's got water. But with the cold conditions, I mean, it'd be, yeah, and it would it, be a close one. Yeah, and especially if his his clothing got wet. The one of the things when we when we called off our hike on Mount Rainier was because 
every we had we had all the rain gear. We didn't have snow gear with us because we were hiking earlier in the year, but um, it was like it was sideways rain on the mountain, and everything got soaked. I had one set of one you know set of clothing left in a dry sack. And I didn't want to bring it. I didn't want to bring it out because as soon as I took anything out of there, it was soaked. My tent was soaked. My sleeping bag was soaked. Everything was soaked except for that stuff in the dry bag. So yeah, and you want to you want to have dry things if you're wet and cold. Yeah, we couldn't even get a fire going. So, you know, in those kinds of conditions, I don't see how you could survive more than a day or two. Um, you know, up there. So, but. Uh, moving on to the next day. So now it is October 26th, 2020. This is about two weeks after the search uh, started. National Park Service actually declares Sam Duball dead. Now, they have they didn't recover his uh, body. They didn't. Re- they don't have any evidence of really what happened to him. The reason why they declare and usually people are declared dead after a longer time has elapsed, but. Um, usually the searchers and the officials in the park will kind of look at the situation and like, there's no possible way he could have survived for two weeks out here with the storms. And, um, you know, this potentially was done by officials in the state level because he was a state employee and this would allow his family to collect life insurance and pension money. So, um, there's no point in dragging that off dragging it out if officials don't think there's any chance of finding him. So it's kind of a, 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 a way to help the family out in a real troubling, you know, trying time. I do have a, in to, to back this declaration up. I do have a statement from the university of Washington, which uh, is a direct quote after days of determined and robust effort. No sign of Sam has been found by the search and rescue teams. He is beyond reasonable expectation of survival uh, in the environment of the slopes of Mount Rainier in October. Although there will be a final aerial search and another check of local medical facilities, the Duballs believe that Sam has merged with Mother Mountain. In all likelihood, he is in the arms of the goddess. So, um, you know, everyone's kind of coming to terms, you know, two weeks after he went missing that, you know, he's probably, you know, gone. I, I, my hope is maybe in the spring when things start thawing out that officials will eventually find his remains. Um, yeah, you think so? I, you know, who knows? I think a lot of these cases, uh, the, the remains are never found or they're found years and years later. I, the only thing I, I think that might help in finding his remains is that if he was buried in snow, that that will somewhat preserve um, preserve him to make it easier sure. for, you know, someone to find him, but it, he may never be found. And I found, uh, I found a local's take on this case and I will preface this. It, it's from Reddit. <laughs> I, as, as Joe knows, and everyone knows, I, I don't usually like pulling stuff from Reddit, but I've been doing it more frequently. <laughs> I think as long as you tell people where it's from yeah, and we make the disclaimer, Hey, this is from Reddit, a place where people can post things. Yeah. So I, we didn't call somebody go. from Mount Rainier and talk to him, but so this alleged resident of the area said he was hiking alone, doing an overnight trip. They found his water bottle along the trail and based on the location, he made it about three fourths through his planned trip. That last one fourth doesn't have any major river crossing, so it's possible he was above Timberline and got lost in a blizzard. He sounded prepared with all the necessary overnight gear, so it seemed like something major happened, like a fall. So that is an interesting take on kind of the location where they think he might have gone missing. Uh, I've been in those areas of Mount Rainier where you're above the Timberline and there's absolutely no shelter. So if you get stuck in a blizzard up there, it's tough. <laughs> and just some other, before we wrap this up and move into the theories, just a couple other uh, details and notes from the search and rescue. The family actually started a change.org uh, petition to, to try to force officials to keep the search going. They uh, were quoted as saying, there is a very high chance that Sam is alive. He is still in the window of survivability, even with hunger and hypothermia, which 
Many medical experts estimate between two and three weeks with the type of gear he was carrying. So, you know, the, the family is really hopeful. I, based on our other cases, especially the one with Michael Napinski, I don't know how someone could last two or three weeks with hypothermia and frostbite. I, yeah, I agree with you I, on that. Yeah, I don't see how how that's possible, but you know that's their opinion, and they they want to find him alive. They uh, they go on to say in this uh, GoFundMe or no this Change.org petition, they are quoted uh, with a high level of uh, fitness and experience and gear, including a tent, sleeping bag, raincoat, and more. There's a reasonable chance that he is still currently surviving beyond the missing day twelve. Uh, finally, there have been gaps in the search. The search and rescue teams were prevented from areas and had to scale back because of severe weather and were unable to go back to those areas. With better and even clearer weather on the horizon, Mount Rainier is offering a prime opportunity to continue the search, and we hope to take advantage of this one last effort. And they finally go on to say that a hiker was just found in Mount Zion at day 19, we are only at search day 11. There's hope. Sam is fit. He has gear. We are just at search day 11. I, you know, that's all positive and great to say, but I think Zion and Mount Rainier are completely two different parks. I could see someone surviving 19 days in Zion. Um, yeah. You, well, they said Mount, is, that, is Mount Zion in Zion National Park? Um, No. You know that that's interesting. I apologize to the listeners. Mount Zion. I'm assuming they mean Zion National Park. We'll we'll research that further and correct it in the uh, show notes if we have to. But uh, assuming they mean Zion National Park, you know you're not yeah. dealing with the exposure risk in Zion. I, we we got stuck in Zion in some really bad weather up on the North Rim, but the next day it was it was sunny and warm out again. Um, yeah, and after a quick search, I'm not even finding a Mount Zion outside of Mount Zion, the hill in Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not I'm not finding I it's coming up as Zion National Park. So I think you're right. Yeah. I just wanted to I wanted to clarify for myself. Oh wait, hold on, hold on. Mount Zion Trail in Washington. Okay. It might be that. So yeah, we, we're not sure what Zion they're talking about, but I think in their second statement, they, they talk about all of the severe weather up on the mountain. I think that contradicts the, the point of that he could maybe still be alive. I, I just think based on the other cases we've seen from the Mount Rainier area and other Alpine areas, that it would be, a, it, inc- it would be the, one of the most incredible survival stories in human history, I think, uh, for someone to be able to survive those conditions. Could it be possible? Yeah, it would be it would be pretty intense. I and yeah, uh, I think it's possible, but yeah. unlikely.